Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, how dare you, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. And one last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by 10th Man, Arwin, Righteous Force, uh, Chocolate Sane and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. There's a few latecomers into Discord, so I'll take them off mute. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Morning. Morning. Morning, morning, morning. I keep losing my signal, so good morning. Yep. Try and keep yourself on mute, whoever, and everybody, because lots of background noise is just irritating. Well, welcome one and all. How's it all going? Good. How's the weather over there? How's the weather? There's about 500 new people joined this channel in the last 24 hours. Thanks to Eddie Bravo shouting me out. So massive oh, really? appreciation to Eddie Bravo for his shout out on Sam Tripoli's show. So he was um, interviewing DITRH and he said very specifically, love Nathan Oakley, that guy kicks ass or words to that effect. And uh, yeah, basically... Thank you very much, Eddie Bravo. Really appreciate the shout out. And hello to everyone who's recently subscribed to the channel as a direct consequence of seeing him say he likes me and go and subscribe. So thank you very much to all of you who've just joined the channel. Where can we find that video? I've, I've trimmed out shout a section out of it. Eddie. It's it's on Sam Tripoli's channel. So that's, uh, I think uh -huh. the channel's called the Tinfoil Hat, Sam Tripoli. I think that's the name of the channel. Um, but it's okay. on his second to most recent video, which is with eddie bravo that's in the title i can't remember the exact title of the video i'd have to look it up but yeah check it out it's on sam tripoli's channel um i'll trim out that little bit and strap it onto the end of one of the other videos that i've done um so yeah so i'll put it out that'll be the next little video although it's not little's probably not the right word because it's about 28 minutes long but there we go i'll strap it onto the end of that yeah another big shout out thank you very much and hello to everyone who's just subscribed uh, any signs of Earth curvature? Geometric horizon, formerly known as Earth curvature? Not from Sam Tripoli's channel. What? Not from any Bravo's training sessions. That axial rotation? Not... Any signs of that? Hang on. Hang on. Not from a flying kick from Bruce Lee. <laughs> axial rotation of the hip burst variety. <laughs> no axial no rotation. Only Bruce Lee doing a roundhouse kick. That's the only axial rotation. And um, Mind Smash did a video about um, not Eddie Bravo. He's his compadre, Joe Rogan, and it showed Joe Rogan doing a a kick onto one of these machines that measures force, and he out kicked some of the guys who are actually in the ring. I didn't. I mean, I knew Joe Rogan was hard as nails, but I didn't know he was that hard as nails. If you know what I mean. No, he's lethal. Yeah. I, when I saw it, I was like, I don't know. I couldn't give you the, the pounds, feet, or whatever it is in, in force that he measured. But like I say, it was more than one of the guys who's currently in the ring, competitively fighting, and Joe Rogan was was giving a more more severe kick. <laughs> you're like, bloody hell, man! You're a monster. <laughs> anyway, just just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, right, where were we? Any signs of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? 
Nope. Unless you want to assume that uh, the stars spinning around uh, is a, a reason enough to assume that the Earth is a globe underneath it. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Nope. Not at all. They don't even know what it is. We don't even know what it is. There's uh, they can't even... And that's it. Oh, sorry, everyone. No, I said if they can't even get their geometric horizon measured, which is right here in front of us, how are they going to get that one? Right here in front of us, or is a, a fixed distance based on observer height when in orthographic view in a model? Well, I'm kind of playing on words there because there's only one horizon and as you say apparent horizon is redundant and one day it's here the next day it's there it's always moving based on the way the day holds between temperatures and visibility so they're the ones telling us we live on a sphere and that if they had a sphere as our place of habitation it would be a physical edge physical curvature and they're going to be moving around boys yeah it could be obscured but it can be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and feet when in the orthographic geography geography geometry that is earth curve mathematics like this on screen this is muppet vision you on the left looking at a boat on the right you never get this point of view you never see the side of your own head but that's how earth curve maths excludes perspective because the measurement for the boat and how much is being obscured by this claim of a physical edge getting in the way is going to be giving you in feet and inches or meters. So they'll ask you on the globe side, why is, let's call it, 20 feet of this boat missing? Well, 20 feet is 20 feet at this distance or a million miles because you can draw a line between the two and write any value you like. Now, at that scale, that was probably about 3,000 miles. Well, you could actually write 3,000 on it if you like, because the boat, nice and big to make my point even better, is never going to change in actual size, feet and inches or meters. The angular size, however, does get smaller as you get further away from it. But they call that effect Earth Curve, because they turn it side on to remove that aspect, i.e. perspective, things getting smaller with distance. But you don't, have, you don't see the side of your own head. That's why we call it Muppet Vision. That Muppet Vision is used in everything they do, uh, from celestial navigation to this picture that you showed there. Uh, and, they, and you hear the statement from them, uh, this could never happen on the flat Earth, or uh, it's impossible for this to ever, ever happen on the flat Earth. Uh, the only problem is it could only happen on the flat plane. <laughs> but they use these images like begging the image like begging the question same thing yeah we must see the world in an orthographic muppet vision representation that excludes perspective i.e we must see it in our sphere earth geometric geometric terms only and if we remove the geometry that causes things to disappear according to our assertion in this model then you can draw a straight line between target and observer that's never obstructed because it's only obstruction that causes things to disappear they never get too small to see. Therefore, you should be able to see New York from England because it's never going to get too small to see. And the only thing that's stopping you seeing it is Earth Curve getting in the way according to, to Earth Curve geometry and side view, Muppet Vision, orthographic representation where you see the side of your own head. Well, it's their biggest Achilles heel because if they're going to show us these pictures and once we as... Uh, you know, the panel, you and others who have contributed to deciphering what these pictures do, well, then they must show a physical geometric horizon based on the radius. And we can use these pictures against them. We can put an X where it's supposed to be, and it's never there. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Nope. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? No, just observations. These people call themselves science. Questions call, been, call whatever you want to call yourself. This question's been, been on the show for 18 months now, right? Yep. 
These people are still under the banner of science. Why aren't we getting any scientific hypothesis from any of these fields? Why, why isn't it coming because, our way? Because according to them, the minute we ask this pertinent question, they say, well, science doesn't prove things. I get paid anyway. <laughs> yeah. So what? I've got no science. Got a paycheck. What are you going to do about it? We're going to like ignore that one. Yesterday, we called you three years ago, science, science deniers. Uh, I've got that. chocolate and stoggy. I'll go with chocolate because I had him first, but you can go next. How do you say your name? Staggol? Staggoli. Staggoli. Sorry, chocolate. That's okay. Go ahead, cho chocolate. No, you're good. I was just saying that we what we do is we ignore three years ago when we were telling all you flat earthers that you guys are science deniers because we have all this science to prove the globe. We're going to ignore that. And in 2020, we tell you, no, science doesn't prove things. Matter of fact, we don't even need scientific method. That's how that's how insignificant science is. We don't even need the method. Well, don't forget chocolate. It's probab probabilistic belief now, remember? <laughs> <laughs> probabilistic belief, bro. I'm mad. <laughs> Right, Staggerly, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you could be like that guy yesterday that thought uh, natural law was science. Even having a, but he claimed himself, claimed he was a scientist, but didn't even know. Yeah. I'm glad we trailed uh, on this. Because, that. go on, go on, chocolate. No, I was going to say, I, I wasn't here yesterday. Somebody. Yeah, said natural law is science. Yeah, I think his name was Brew. Oh, Brew. Did, did he name the scientific method that one of these natural laws, uh, the experiment that one of these natural laws were went through, or no? No, he obfuscated yeah. and rumpused. Uh, ah, <laughs> yeah. tactics. Gotcha. Yeah, tactics. I I'm glad we've dwelled on this particular housekeeping question because it's important. As you, you've already got to the point, I was going to get to at the end chocolate because you could like that which is to say that we were challenged to provide science because they had the whole body of it behind their globe belief yeah that was two or three years ago well now we're at the stage where one of the housekeeping questions is provide us any hypothesis any it doesn't have to have even been gone through the method it doesn't have to be validated you don't have to give us the experiment just give us a valid hypothesis that's all because you've got phenomena so let's see you formulate a hypothesis that's valid and we haven't had a single one because it's not science. So the turnaround has gone in many different ways. We've got the edge that we were asked to provide. Well, now they've not got a geometric sphere edge for a horizon. There's the science that we were challenged to give them. And they haven't got any science. They've got a whole bunch of pseudoscience. There's a whole list of them. You know, the dome. Well, hold on a second. Why are we being challenged to provide a, a dome when your sky vacuum stands in violation of natural law? We require a container. But yet you're demanding that we show you a glass dome like Simpsons showed. So, you know, all these things have turned around in the period that I've been in this subject. Completely turned around on their head. And the, one of the things that I now want to turn around is the ridicule. It's socially acceptable to completely smear and uh, ridicule Flat Earth and Flat Earthers. And the personal attacks, they're not justified or allowed anymore by YouTube. Their standards have been raised, and it has to be across the board. But the general societal standard is that you can call a, a globe denier a moron without any argument attached. Now, the standards for us, we discussed this in the pre-show, the standards for us are much higher. For me to get away with calling somebody a clown and a moron is to have me rip their argument apart and pretty much have them admit themselves that their argument's nonsense and then call them a moron for their moronic nature and their moronic declarations. That's what I have to do to get away with that. But get away with it I will, and applauded for it I will be by our side while simultaneously told that I'm being unfair. <laughs> it's a great day. It's a beautiful thing. So yeah, it's all turned on its head, Chocolate. You're absolutely right. You got to my point before I wanted to, but I'm glad you did because it's actually... Where's all the body of science for the globe? <laughs> Where did that go to? Why is it now the case that we're asking you for science and getting silence? Yep. So let's make a little conclusion. There's no scientific evidence to assert we have gravity, to assert we've got a sphere, to assert the sky is a vacuum called outer space. There's no science for any of this. 
None. Zero. Nada. It does not exist. It was asserted that the whole body of science backed this belief, this philosophy of being on a globe. It doesn't. That was an outright lie. It was all pseudoscience. Just so stories. It's funny because then sometimes they'll ask us, well, where's your science? And we say, well, we're, we're not asserting science. Because whether the Earth... No, that guy said he was a scientist. Question. It's not even a scientific question. Science is a cause and effect. <laughs> That's a what is question. Right? We're not the, the ones who assert The guy science said he was a scientist. Earth, but they assert that science proves the globe. That's why we're asking for science. We don't need science to figure out that it's flat. <laughs> that's that's observed, and that right. can be measured. That's not science, <laughs> right? But yeah, now, yeah. Neil, Neil's trying to get in that Edgeway's chocolate to say that yeah, the guy's asserting science. I'm a scientist. In other words, appeal to authority fallacy. Respect my authority. I'm a scientist. Therefore, what I say will go from here on in. That's why I've told you I'm a scientist. That's the only reason they do it. Well, why is he claiming to be a scientist? Well, because then everything he says will be deemed scientific. And it isn't. It's just an appeal to authority fallacy. Because science is basically the adherence to the scientific method. And if you are adhering to that method, they don't actually label you a scientist either. They label you a researcher. The researcher will vary the independent variable and see if it causes the effect. That's how they describe it when you look at the definitions. The researcher... Now, don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's plenty of definitions that do say scientist, but that's what a scientist is, somebody who's applying that method. Outside of it, if you happen to have applied it at some point in your life, does that make you a scientist? Arguably, yes. But does that mean that what you're doing there and then when you declare that you are a scientist suddenly requires more validity being linked to it? No, of course not. But that's the magic. That's the words. Science. I'm a scientist. All oh, right. Well, we must respect your authority. Then we must stand under everything you say here. Then, no. So it's safe to say he was a pseudo scientist. Then, if you declare something as science, this is the problem with astrophysicists. They will declare quite boldly that what they're doing is science or scientific, or they'll declare scientific vocabulary and vernacular when detailing something that they're doing, like experiment. That's a very abused word. Well, if you're contextually talking about science and you're contextually using words like test, you are talking about an, a, a hypothesis test. That's what you are talking about. So it's very specific, narrow. It's the scientific method, the empirical method that will give you a truth, a result at the end, an empirical result, validating either you're null i.e. you didn't get it right, it didn't cause the effect, or your alternative, it did cause the effect, empirical. Well, the reason they want to hijack these words, the astrophysicists, is because they can observe phenomena, but then they can't carry out the rest of the method. So when they assert their nonsense pseudoscience stories under the banner of science, it means it becomes pseudoscience. It's a declaration of science where there hasn't been an application of the scientific method. That's what pseudoscience is. So... While sometimes they don't necessarily directly tie one to the other, in the case of Michio Kaku, he actually declare how it isn't science. He'll, he'll openly and boldly laugh away at how it isn't science. But other people like Neil deGrasse Tyson will create an air, like that guy did, the guy we're talking about on, on the panel, an air of scientific validity. So he'll make true statements about how science is valid, whether you like it or not. Absolutely true. It's empirical doesn't matter if you like the result at the end of the experimentation. That's the result. Empirically validated. You've either validated your null or validated your alternative. You will do one or the other at the end of the test. Well, he'll state that overtly. Well, that leaves you with the impression that he, as a scientist, has the empirical answers when he talks about his just-so stories about lights in the sky. And nothing could be closer to science. It's miles removed from science, even though he's created that persona, that impression, that everything he says is true whether you like it or not. Because science is true whether you like it or not. He just doesn't have any. So he's not overtly stating, when I declare that the sun is a burning ball of gas in a vacuum in violation of natural law, that's science. He doesn't actually say that overtly. He just creates this air around him, Neil deGrasse Tyson, that he is adhering to the scientific method in general terms, therefore a scientist, and everything he says goes when he makes up a bloody story.
But yeah, to be more specific, Neil, and answer your question, pseudoscience is a non-adherence to the scientific method where declared as science. So you say, I've got science. The whole body of science proves we're on a sphere. Well, what's proving we're on a sphere? Look at my earth curve maths. Well, that ultimately makes the earth curve maths by declaration of the claimant in that example, pseudoscience. It's claimed to be scientific. I've heard Mick West specifically say that. To me personally. No, it isn't. That makes it pseudoscience. Non-application of the scientific method, claimed to be science, is defined as pseudoscience. Moving on. Mick West also, he Go also on. did say that uh, the R value is a presupposition based on the standard model. So thanks, Mick West. That's you you and me are like on, on exactly the same frequency. So I was just about to ask about the R value, knowing full well where that would go, chocolate, and you've preempted it. So any evidence of the R value? <laughs> no, Mick West. In their model. <laughs> In their model. Here's, I got a question. Isn't um, Michio Kaku and... Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, aren't they both astrophysicists? Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay, so then Mikio Kaku says we don't use the scientific method, and you're saying Neil deGrasse Tyson saying we are? Is that what you should just say? I think, think Mikio well, Kaku Michio calls Kaku himself a, says... a, th a theoretical physicist as opposed to an astrophysicist. Theoretical physicist, I think, is his title. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, Mikio Kaku is a theoretical physicist. There you go. So what? Wordsmith pseudoscientist. What's your point, no one Paul? in my field under uses the scientific method. It's leaps of logic. It's seat of the pants. It's guesswork. Yep. Did you, did you have something to add to that, Paul, before I move on to... Molten iron cores. No, I've got a stream in six months old. There it is. Any evidence of a self perpetuating molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical Earth? No, no, no. No, it's very little indication that. It, yeah, there's there's nothing around. They, they don't really talk about it anymore a lot. What do they? Oh yeah, P waves, S waves, right? Yeah. That's it. You gotta get there quicker. <laughs> Say it with more determination as well. No. P waves and F waves. That's how you gotta say it. Not my argument. I know, but you often play baller. It's fun. Yeah, I guess. But I don't know. You know, from a baller perspective, I'd rather just abandon the ent math entirely. Because it turned out that, uh, yeah, on the long run, it didn't really work out all that well. You know? But it works in the math. The math, the math works in the math, bro. So you got to hold on yeah. to it. <laughs> so, you know, in the mind, it works in my mind. So Yeah, we... see? It's great. There's that word again. Just apply that to reality. Is that word? Well, don't, don't, don't forget. Why would don't you forget do that? Me. Works, right? Works. It's a magic word. Do we remember when I went over this a couple of shows ago? Well, just remember, only way they can prove things is in math. So they've got to depend upon math. Don't forget that. But the maths is claimed to work, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, I can make math work all day long, but it doesn't mean it matches reality, right? Okay, make math produce a cup of coffee. Go. Nice. I can give you a formula. I, 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 ratio no, 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 no. Water. I, I, I want to highlight the magic trick with this word, work. W-O-R-K, work. Right? You've just said, I can get the maths to work. And what you mean by that is you can get a formula together to describe something with the language of maths. Correct, Paul? Exactly. Uh, now, I can make it work on paper. That doesn't yeah. work so okay. <laughs> on paper. Yeah, okay, on paper. N now put it to physical task. I want the maths to produce a cup of coffee. Go. I can draw it. Would that work? I can draw a cup of coffee on a piece of paper and pour it out of a coffee pot. Would that work? Can I drink it? 
<laughs> I, I got one better than the coffee, though. See, we know, we know that we went to the moon because they successfully calculated how much fuel it would it would be ne- ne- necessary to have to go to the moon. So, because those calculations were done, therefore we went to the moon. That's how we know we went to the moon. The, the math works. By Neil deGrasse Tyson himself. Perfect example. So that's an example of the maths works. So if I explain how the maths works, you are left with a description. Well, you can then visualize the description and reify it into existence. So you can have the idea of something physically pushing through the sky vacuum working. Burning fuel, doing physical work, based on the maths, that's not doing any work. It's a magic trick. The word work is used to juxtapose the abstract with the physical. So, big fuel tanks doesn't mean we went to the moon? It's just maths. Oh, you don't even have to get to the fuel tank. Just do the math on the paper and you got it. Right, it's just a simulation of reality. And if the simulation works out, then you just assume that you did it in reality. Precisely, Arwen. It's abstract. That's what maths is. So, again, what a turnaround. So, 2015, Reg Rhetoric, math is reality, end quote. No, it isn't. Math is completely abstract. Can't put it to work. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container for the gas to press upon? Bearing in mind that 95% of the Western world are under the misapprehension that the sky is a massive available volume for the gas to fill. Any evidence that you can have the gas we all breathe without containment? I'd like to say something about that. We've got bouncy balls. (laughs) Bouncy balls go down, go boom, boom have to sweep up those gas off the bottom of the vacuum chamber. Go ahead, Moosetone. Yeah, look, I let you off the hook uh, last week playing baller. So, uh, look, I mean, I think there's something um, that perhaps is not well understood. I mean, you you did say that um, uh, a cup of coffee is, is a container, right? So, I mean... Obviously, the Earth, uh, whatever its shape, uh, just based on its topography, is also a container, right? So there you have it. There you have your container. For liquid? Things like lakes and stuff? Yeah, and the Grand Canyon, you know, it contains air, does it not? Yeah, but the air that's there would require containment to be there in the first instance. Correct. So we're still at the same exact I mean, scenario. Without the container, there can be no at, pressure. But at best, at best, you've just debunked the time it takes to to escape in into the vacuum of the universe. Sorry, that's described very, very rigorously in the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy is proportional to time. That is the second law of thermodynamics. No, I was trying to make a joke. I mean. Um... <laughs> My bad. There's me all getting serious <laughs> about entropy. No, I mean you're, at y- best, y- you're right. You know where what, that's going. What, what, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that at best, um, the uh, you know it it takes a few seconds or or ten minutes um, to escape completely into um into in, you know into the vacuum of space. So instead of here, you got remaining there, you got effusion or diffusion. <laughs> well, these these entropy effects that seem to come up at the moment. I don't know why. But effusion is a, is a describing entropy increase. That's what the effect is. Same with diffusion. So this has been covered twenty times on various ball busters and quantum eraser presentations about entropy, specifically right. about entropy. But yet we're being told, no, no, that's diffusion. All oh, right, so what? Stuff fused, the same as diffusion, but through a barrier, through a membrane. So what? what's the membrane that we've got? This magical gravity force is now a membrane. 
Yeah, it always it always was asserted as a special force field. But gas doesn't go down, go boom, boom with an exclusive downward vector of gravity. It expands in all directions to fill the availability of volume it has to fill. And space is claimed to be a massive volume for the gas to fill. And fill it, it will, if it was real. It isn't because we've got gas pressure. And to have the gas pressure in the example where how long will it take for the gas to fill the availability of volume, i.e. outer space, if it was real? Well, it could take 10 minutes for all of the C to vaporise. Or I would say, oh, it would take a couple of seconds for it to all vaporise and disappear into space. However, that scenario would first require a means of gathering up the gas pressure to then release it i.e. to have this scenario we'd have to have a massive container and then remove the container and release it into a hypothetical sky vacuum now the fact that there is no container on the heliocentric model it's just completely available space for gas to fill is the violation of natural law that debunks the idea we have a sky vacuum because we wouldn't be breathing We've never had the scenario where we've got containment to form gas pressure to then argue about how long it would take to fill a sky vacuum at 10 to the minus 17 tor. Yeah, it would be instantaneous, but we'd never actually achieve gas pressure because in the scenario that is the heliocentric world, there is no containment whatsoever. So you'd never achieve gas pressure there, in the first place. There is one. There is one. Earth. Gravity. I just told you. Don't you understand it? <laughs> what, what was it you told me? There is a container, he Earth. Earth. He said Earth. Earth? That's not a container. Their yeah. argument of a presupposed well, spherical a cup, Earth... If a cup of coffee is a container, then Earth is also a container. For liquid. Yeah, but Gas does not behave like that. It's containing the coffee, which is liquid. Hold That's on, right? Chuck. No, 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 no. The, the cup no. of coffee <laughs> is in the container of the world, and therefore things work as they do. Yes. Because it is all contained. That's true. Yeah, to, to, in other words, I was saying without the container, the bloody coffee would vaporize. But the point is that this is we're describing liquids. You're, you're using a false analogy, a false equivalence rather, because gas is bond, unbonded and liquid's bonded. So you can sit liquid in these lakes. But like Arwen's just said, they wouldn't. the lakes wouldn't be there if the sky was a vacuum. The whole bloody thing would vaporize. Are you saying that a, a cup of coffee cannot contain air? The liquid that is coffee isn't air, though, is it? You might have bubbles in the froth if you're making a cappuccino suspended within the solid that is foam. I thought the question was gas pressure, not liquid. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's always this yeah, false but, analogy. No, no, no. But no, no. But Nathan, I'm being serious here. I mean, <laughs> are you serious that? No, no, no. But I mean, are, are you serious that um, uh, something that is you know, that is not closed, cannot be a container, even for gas. I mean, I wasn't aware of this distinction between contain containers for liquids and containers for, for gas, to be honest. The, the point is, is that even open containers can only perform container function because they themselves are within a closed container that allows air pressure to stabilize and thus materials like water and everything to stay as they are. And not instantly va evaporate. Not instantly, but they do, don't they, Arwen? Yeah. Uh, entropy in, for a liquid in, a, in an open container, there's still entropy increase occurring. So at a very small level, the top surface level of that water, that glass of water that you just leave on the side in an open glass, is evaporating. Well, that's taking a very long time, but you leave a glass long enough and it'll just disappear. The water will vanish. It'll just evaporate. That's entropy increase. Now, it might be very, very, very slow. However, entropy is still increasing. It's a natural law. So while you say, oh, well, I can put a glass in, uh, I can put a, uh, some water in a glass, and there you go, look, it's not escaping. You're like, well, okay, come back in 10 years and see if the water's still there. The entropy is still increasing, and it's still proportional to time, calculable with the second law of thermodynamics, and it's still going to occur. So while you might appear at surface level on a very short time frame to have a perfect container with an open glass, it simply is not the case. A perfect example of that is when you have, a say, a glass or a cup of coffee while you're driving and you don't drink it all. And you leave it a little bit at the bottom. You come back to your car, it's all caked up and the liquid's gone. 
Entropy's a bitch if you've Look, got a sky I, vacuum belief, basically. I, I think you're... You guys are going... You're whistling past my question. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit... Um, maybe I'm a bit pedantic, but it does seem to me that technically, you know, even something that is open is still still contains air. Well, you're, you're, what your yeah, question is malformed because you're you've got that thing next to a vacuum. And you also seem to be confusing liquids and gas. What happens if you have your your cup of coffee in a vacuum? Hard. What's going to happen? <laughs> What's going to happen? The vaporize. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting vaporize. for him to answer. Yeah, look, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so. Earth. It's going to get cold. So what's going to happen is that whatever we have now would never exist because it would have been vaporized already is what Nathan is saying, if it was an open system. But No, I, I agree with that, but so it you still have any has water. contained it. But are you saying it, it's, not, so it's, you know, it's not a container then? For, for, no, no, you're for, stuck for... on the word container. We're talking open and closed systems adjacent to that container. Do you think that a lake in the mountain is able to hold water because it's not some type of container? Or do you think there's a little cavity there and it can hold water? Of course, it acts as a container. But now stick uh, that next on. to a vacuum, hold on, what happens? Hold on. No, no, no. no, no. So the, the lake example, you think that all the water's contained. How, how does any of it get out to turn into clouds then, if it's all contained? How would that occur? It wouldn't if it was contained now as chocolates pointed out this is liquid well we're talking about gas unbonded so it's expanding in all directions no exclusive downward vector with gravity all directions unlike liquid okay look fair enough i, I agree with that i just i just wanted to you know raise the point i, I and i wasn't aware that so, you know, the definition of a container dependent of what's in it. That, that You know, I wasn't aware of that. That's not dependent no, on what's in it. A container just contains things, no. man. No, We're just a... talking about two different things being contained. In no, no. one area, you're talking about a liquid. The other one, you're talking about a gas. No, this, no right? the, separate, you can, the, separate, you... the separate categorizations for these containers that you're describing. Closed and open. Containers. Well, it's real simple, actually. Yeah, okay. You need a you, you don't have to have a closed container to contain a liquid necessarily, unless you don't want it to spill out if you knock it over. But with a gas, you need a closed container so it doesn't go everywhere. So it just depends on you know. I guess it's logical, making logical sense to me. But isn't it that isn't it the weight of the water keeping it in the glass though? Because that's going to so be no, so the weight of the water is keeping the lake there. How does how do the clouds form, Paul? Is it contained? No, not really. It'll eventually evaporate out if you don't uh, have any other source of shockingly, replenishing the lake. <laughs> shockingly, there's a there's a natural law that describes that. You know what it's called? Uh, entropy. Is that yeah. Or well, how do you know? Gas cycle <laughs> or, or, or water cycle? It's entropy. Entropy is describing that process. The change. However, as I said, this is just open or closed systems. How they how they will interact with their environment is dependent on whether or not it's open or closed. So for a liquid, the same principle applies over a longer period of time, in this instance when we're describing water. You know, the same principle could be applied to a very heavy inner gas. So in the same way as the water example, even though we're talking now about an unbonded gas, so the effect will be far faster. The effect is exactly the same. How the entropy affects the sulfur hexafluoride in a fish tank is similar in terms of how it's actually escaping to how the water, although it's going through a phase change, is also escaping its open container. Now, with the sulfur hexafluoride, it doesn't have to change state. It's completely unbonded. So other particles can get underneath and in between all of the sulfur hexafluoride. And over time, it will just dissipate to fill whatever volume it has because it's unbonded. So the other gas particles can get in between, underneath, and eventually push out all of the sulfur hexafluoride. But in the same way that in an open fish tank is the same as a, an open lake. 
It's not contained. It's still succumbing to entropy. The entropy increase is still there. Now, with a lake, you could describe it as slow. In reality, it's probably not that slow when you look at the surface level and see the water cycle. It's actually quite quick. But yet you can still, at a, uh, uh, an ignorant level, assert that it's a closed container. It isn't. It's open. Therefore, you're going to have the effects of entropy described with how they affect an open system. Because that's precisely what it is. And entropy speaks to that oh. directly. It's proportional to time. Can I just say... Can I just say one last thing on that? Sorry, after all... Of course, I, go I, ahead, Moose Toad. Look, You're doing well. Look, no, but w when you're saying the necessary antecedent is a container, then, when you're talking about air pressure, actually, what you, you mean is the necessary antecedent is a closed container, right? Yeah, to have the gas not fill the available volume, for entropy in to not increase into the available space that it has available, claimed by the heliocentric model, then yeah, we must have containment. Now, containment means exactly that. It's the gas is contained. Well, obviously, if it's an open system, then the gas is not contained. <laughs> so it's not going to stay here if it's not contained. It's uncontained. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Right. Gas and will fill the space. can only exist within a closed container, basically, as you pointed out earlier. Well, and also, just think, containers are required to slow down entropy. Like, even with water, like liquid water, if you don't have it in a glass, the process of entropy will be faster. So you, even with a glass of water or anything, a lake, having that containment slows down the process. It doesn't cease it, but it slows it down. Right. So even in a... So go ahead. Well, it's just general say the entropy. Sa the same applies but to osmosis. So if you've got something that's transferring, that's it's literally sucking up and redistributing it through, say, a membrane, then well, that process of the water distribu distribution from one side of the barrier to the other, the osmosis is described as an entropy increase. So we've we've only had to come cover this for some bizarre reason because we're now just having various other subcategories of entropy described to us as though they are the answer to how you can have gas pressure without a container. Like diffusion, described with an entropy increase, is somehow the answer to us explaining that the second law of thermodynamics describes how gas will fill the availability of a volume if the sky was a volume for it to fill. And it's just a description of, of something that happens always. Hey, Mustone, let me ask you a question before you go. Hopefully you won't go. Uh, to create pressure, air pressure, gas pressure will it work in the open container or only in a closed container well look i mean no i think it's a you, certainly you need a you need a closed container okay so now i have several compressors on my property and at the bottom there's a release valve if i open up that release valve and turn on uh, the air compressor so it can build pressure is it going to build pressure at all to any significance if the release valve is letting all of it dissipate? No, correct. It's probably not going to be, you know, well, then it's, it's I guess it's a question of degree. It's a question of magnitude, but, right? No, no, no. But, it uh, never no. achieves pressure. It will never, with that release valve, a little hole, it's not anything like the size of the chamber, just with that hole open, it'll never achieve gas pressure. It'll all just leak out, always. Same with your tire. With that. Your tire, right? You've got uh, a hole I in your tire. Were, I, you go and pull the you go and pull the nail out. Then you go to the gas compressor and try and fill the tire. What happens? It goes flat again because there's a hole in it. Okay, no, I thought there was pressure in the meantime. You know, while it was leaking, but maybe I'm mistaken. Oh, I see. And Earth, like the picture on screen now, is that is that claimed to be the black bit? Is that a great big covering? And it's just got a little hole in it. Is that what that is? <laughs> well, you tell me, Nathan, what you claim the dome is. Huh? I'm not making any claims no, about no, domes. No. My claim no, no, is specific. Uh... It's about gas pressure. <laughs> to have gas pressure, you must have containment. So if this is this picture right, of the sun and the earth, well, to have the gas in this area that we're looking at, it must be contained. Simple as that. Yes. If the black area, however, was a 10 to the minus 17 Tor vacuum, 
this gas that we're breathing would immediately evacuate into the area available to it. So this area, this black bit, is not a vacuum. It's just that simple. Outer space is fake. The sky is not a vacuum. I would also say, don't try not to get confused by people like, uh, what's his face? The blue marble, hillbilly, <laughs> uh, redneck, um, who claims to prove gas pressure without a container using two containers. Um, <laughs> that's kind of not the point. So he, he kind of debunked himself by using two containers and asserting that that's somehow gas pressure without one because he's got two in the video. And then we'll assert that a pipe, even though it might be an open pipe, is not a container. Yeah, but well, chocolate. Yeah. But chocolate. Yeah, he, got a, he got a like on that video from Danny Faulkner. <laughs> he got a like from Danny Faulkner. <laughs> yeah, a PhD <laughs> asserts that as his proof of gas pressure without a container. A video with two I'm containers. Just... Yeah, I'm just Thank trying to anticipate to what kind of arguments they might come up with in the future, that's all. Oh, we got top three. We know exactly what their arguments are. We've just had number two. Chocolate's just given a former number one, might I add, down one at number two, with Hillbilly Blue Balls, the Redneck Retard, Blue Marble Science, is claiming that you can have gas pressure without a container by way of a demonstration with two containers. You know, we've also got Natural Law Doesn't Apply. That's the rumpus's effort at number three but top of the pops used by the guy yesterday and i believe you by the way of devil's advocate is to assert that gas is no longer gas it's actually behaving like a bonded liquid in your example or in the case of thunderfoot clown behaving like a solid bonded bouncy ball go down go boom boom so when that's presented in an argument like it was by the guy yesterday you end up with a scenario where you have a the most powerful vacuum you can imagine because it doesn't really exist, there is no space. But what they claim is the most powerful vacuum there is, 10 to the minus 17 tor out of space sky vacuum, with gas going down, go boom, boom, needing sweeping up. That's the preposterous nature of asserting that gas behaviour is the same as solid behaviour, or in your case, liquid behaviour. It's not. It's unbonded, it expands in all directions, it doesn't exclusively have a downward vector with this weight invoking gravity. But that's what they do to make their fundamentalist sky vacuum belief work, they just violate natural law or claim that you can have gas pressure without a container when they're demonstrating it with two containers or fundamentally change the nature of gas into solid or liquid in your case. Hey, Quantum Eraser. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, don't forget the argument I said last week, which was, um, you know, by the time it, ex it escapes... New gas has been created on Earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it takes time to <laughs> right. refuse. So, in in the gas compressor example that Tenth Man gave, you're saying that the gas compressor's got enough of a motor to just continually produce gas at such a rate that it overwhelms the valve and does create gas pressure. Correct? Ah, oh, like we're living on a giant fan. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Are you saying exactly like, yeah, that's completely the case. Actually, Earth is like a giant Look, tire with just a little hole no, in it. No, I actually heard that. Ar I actually heard that argument. I, I heard that argument from Ballers saying, you know, by the time, you know, of course, um, it's an open system and gas is escaping. But by the time it escapes, a new gas has been created at ground level. So, so no the scenario way. is you imagine a vacuum and they open a, a vacuum, a real vacuum, like they create one here on Earth. They open the door and all the air rushes in, right? at that rate, with a, a vacuum that's nowhere near as intense as they claim the sky vacuum out of space is. Nevertheless, all the gas instantaneously rushes into the vacuum if they open the door, hypothetically speaking. Now, you're saying that, like in this picture here where I've got a tree behind me and Patricia Steer, you're saying that the, the trees are pumping out gas at a rate that can overwhelm a vacuum and the gas that we're breathing filling that vacuum, bearing in mind that the sky vacuum is claimed to be basically infinite. An infinite amount of space for the gas to fill is going to be compensated by this and these trees that are pumping out gas at a rate of knots to overwhelm that effect. Is that what you're saying? 
I've actually heard a debate, a public debate, you know, with real people um, on a panel, with Globers actually arguing that. Real that's, idiots. That's, yeah. that's so well, ridiculous. The amount that's of force that is exerted by the gas trying to expand within the volume of the container is in a linear way tied into the actual volume of where, uh, yeah, the thing it's supposed to be expanding in. So they... Why well, yeah. don't... It's imaginable amounts of forces to even suggest that it's possible. It's so absurd. You know, you know that argument is not that far off because they gotta I say have something. co-workers who have actually given me that same argument. Yeah, that but the, that... the earth is producing so much gas that it just fills fills it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> As that's it's escaping good... at the same time. Yep. I'm going to get in here some way. Yeah. Now, I've had a tire with a very small pinhole leak, and I could drive it, say, for a week and then it just really goes low, so I gotta fill it up until I get it patched up. However, they're saying all that black stuff that Nathan showed in the picture, that 10 to the minus 17 tore, all that black stuff next to Earth is that leak, meaning it's not small, right? And so if I heard a show with ballers would say more is being produced and less is going out, I just show them that picture and say, you mean this 10 to the minus 17 tore, this all infinite open area you're calling a small pinhole leak time to laugh it's retarded it's retarded yeah i agree well bye guys i have to leave thanks for everything everything all right yeah, buddy yeah and neil if it's a tire example it's retreaded not retarded <laughs> <Pre -treaded. laughs> oh, hey, sleep and worry it Sleeping Warrior says it the best. What is he saying? What? I don't know. It's probably very offensive, so let's not repeat it. Did you want to see uh, the Eddie Bravo shout out? Yes. <laughs> okay. At Earth Proof. Um, I watch on uh, Nathan Oakley. You should follow him on uh, YouTube. Nathan Oakley. 1980 is his youtube channel i love that guy he's awesome he crushes yeah. uh he's got uh the he, he uh broke down the whole black swan proof can you explain the black swan proof and do you have a a picture of that like i have a i have a, a picture inside of a video so uh, can you explain that camera. this is yeah, huge so this is huge so one of the things is, you know, we say we see too far and they, you argue, well, the bottom of that building's missing and, and uh, you know, different amounts are missing each day, which means that the earth is changing. You know, it, it makes absolutely no sense. I'm looking for my screen share button. Um, and so this is one where we had the camera. Can you guys see that? We yeah. had the camera at 1.9, at one, just under two feet uh, height. And at two feet height with a with a globe, which is 24,901 miles around at the, the, the oh, it was at one foot. I'm sorry. The horizon should be no farther than 1.9 miles away. OK, so these are oil platforms that people would argue that, well, some of the bottom is missing. Right. This one's at six point two. This one's at nine point four. And we can see the horizon beyond it. The horizon is beyond the second one where we should not be able to see. I get what you're saying. We I can get actually what you're see the water beyond it. Yeah, um, this is huge. The, yeah. It, the, if if uh, um, we were a ball on a ball that was uh, 24,000 miles in circumference, right. you couldn't see you nine couldn't miles. See the, the, it, the, the curve would, would start at like, what, two miles, Dave? So so here's the thing. If you're a six foot tall person and you use the, you know, the curvature calculator, six at three miles, that's the end of the water. The water's perfectly calm. It should drop below your eye level at six miles because there's a six foot drop, uh, three miles, sorry, three miles, there should be a six foot drop. And we're seeing water past these things. This is, this is the death argument. There is no curvature. The ballers will say, well, the water is being refracted up to the perfect eye height. It doesn't refract it higher. It's, re it's, it's, it's such a ridiculous argument, I have a hard time saying it. <laughs> but this is what we see here. And, and again, if you Google um, you know, flat earth proof, you're going to get the National Geographic who showed up at, we did a laser test. Not, um, uh, it was a laser test. It was at a, a, a great, at um, one of these salt lakes out west. And they did, they were there to film some of it and they did their own test. They, they literally went out with a 
um, with a rowboat and they had a like a, a striped board, red and white stripes, it looked like a big flag, and they held it at the water. And as the boat went away farther and farther, the bottom stripes started disappearing. And the the you know the host and the you know the guys talking, they're like, well, yeah, the bottom's disappearing because it's going over the curvature. But the problem was you could see the water for miles past the boat. Yes. Right? There's no way the water is lifting back up. Here's the problem. This is not a flat earth proof for a baller because they can't even process that idea. It's, it's undeniable proof that of the earth being way bigger than they're telling us or a flat earth. And when I say way bigger, the stuff that we're measuring, the earth would have to be like 30 times as big just to be able to see the things that we're seeing. Yeah, so what you're saying is if you think it's a ball – for these measurements to work, it would have to be giant, so much bigger, and go for. Because, so, dude, I tell people all the time. Every time I I'm forced to sit by the window in in a plane, I will I will wait till we get the thing, and I'll take a picture and I go, it's flat as fuck, man. Okay. Eddie Bravo. I, I love I, I love what he said. This is the deaf argument. <laughs> yes it is black swan so, massive shout out i've spammed the chat with sam tripoli's uh channel with that particular video so the channel name again is tinfoil hat with sam tripoli and uh the broadcast was 340 conspiracy always leads to spirituality with eddie bravo joe Schilling, and david weiss so check it out go and subscribe today to tinfoil hat with sam tripoli and uh, check out that video with Eddie Bravo. So thank you very much indeed to Eddie Bravo for shouting me out. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, a big warm welcome to all of you who have actually subscribed as a direct result of him sending you my way. So another massive thank you to Eddie Bravo for his shout out. Now, if you are watching this show on either Nathan Oakley 1980 Premiering stream or Nathan Oakley Premiering stream for that matter, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live on Nathan Oakley 1980, this is where we bid you farewell. A huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you. Smash the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out nathanoakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. Once again, a massive thank you to today's Discord and G Plus panel. Stay tuned if you're watching on a Premiering stream, and I'll see you all in the next video.